Good morning, and welcome to Westminster Presbyterian Church. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Please listen now to our call to worship in word. With boldness and wonder, we face God, the God of our birth, the God of our baptism, the God of all of our days. We face the God who is creator, redeemer, and sustainer, the God who is love. Come, let us worship God together. Trusting in the grace of God, let us confess our sins together 
before God and one another. Holy God, we confess that our love for you and for others has not been genuine. We have not held fast to what is good. We have lagged in affection for our neighbors. We have not been patient in suffering, nor have we persevered in prayer. We have repaid evil for evil, and we have failed to live peaceably with all. Forgive us and help us to trust in the power of your love. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. Christ has broken the power of sin and death and has opened to us the way to eternal life. Believe this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our scripture reading today is from Luke's Gospel, where Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem, knowing what awaits him there, betrayal, arrest, crucifixion. It is an act of love, showing us God's infinite love for us and for all creation. But as he travels towards Jerusalem, Jesus' words his teachings also show us the same thing. Luke chapter 15 verses 1 through 7. Listen now for God's word to you. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous pe people who need no repentance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The title of this sermon is, You Matter Because God Loves You. Start with two stories. Desmond Tutu, Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town in South Africa, the first indigenous black South African to hold that position, an outspoken opponent of apartheid. In 1984, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his courageous advocacy of nonviolent change in South Africa. It's the early 1990s. He's preaching at Peachtree Presbyterian Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, Peachtree has one of those elevated pulpits, like a ship's crow's nest. The preacher stands on this little platform way high up, right in the middle of the sanctuary, looking down on the whole congregation. Tutu is a small, slight man. 
he climbs the long circular staircase up into the pulpit, slowly. When he finally gets up there, he pauses, says nothing, leans over the railing, scans the congregation, slowly. He's wearing thick, oversized eyeglasses. His eyes look preternaturally large, looking down upon us. Still, he says nothing, scans the congregation again. The silence grows longer until at last, God loves you. He proclaims in this strangely high-pitched but strangely powerful lilting voice. He pauses, looking us over again, slowly. More silence. God loves you. He leans even farther out over the railing. If God were to come to this earth in the form of a praying mantis wearing a black and purple robe, this is what God would look like and sound like. God loves you. His eyes seem to grow even bigger as he says it, magnified behind those large, thick glasses. Palpable discomfort now. Shuffling feet, rustling bulletins, throat clearing, a few muffled coughs. Apparently, you did not hear me. Little children, hear me now. God loves you, and I mean you, and you, and you, and you, and you. Second story, the German-Swiss theologian Karl Barth, no doubt the most renowned Protestant theologian of the 20th century, called the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas by no less than Pope Pius XII. Bart himself is learned and erudite. His writings are learned, erudite, and lengthy. His magnum opus, Church Dogmatics, despite being unfinished upon his death, nonetheless runs to 12 volumes, with the doctrinal sections printed in 12-point type the historical theological in 10, and the Greek and Latin quotations left untranslated. Throughout the second half of the 20th century in mainline Protestant seminaries, his works are required reading. In theology classes, often the only reading. On the first day of class, the professor would walk in. This semester, you will read the works of the great Karl Barth. The students? Well, their reactions varied, ranging from feverish intellectual excitement to, oh my God, do we really have to do this dread? It's the early 1960s. Bard is making a tour of the U.S., coming to, among other places, Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. Needless to say, this is a big deal. I wasn't there for this one, but I have it on good authority. The house is packed. Bart is learned and erudite and lengthy. Then the Q&A. Right away, a student's hand shoots up. The professors exchange worried glances with one another. Dr. Bart, could you summarize your theology in a single sentence? 
Now the professors are ready to crawl under their chairs in embarrassment. Here we have the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas in our midst, the author of the magnificent and voluminous church dogmatics, who was just given this learned, erudite, and lengthy lecture. And this, this student has the nerve to ask, not for the Cliff Notes version, but for him to sum up his whole theology in a single sentence. Oh my God. Bart pauses. Could I summarize my theology in a single sentence, you ask? Yes, that's right. Longer pause. Bart takes off his glasses, wipes them with his handkerchief, puts them back on, gives a little sideways smile and says, I think I would use the words of a song my mother sang to me when I was a little child. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Two of the most renowned figures of our time, the great prophetic church leader and the great profound church theologian, and their message is the same. God loves you. Jesus loves me and you and you and you. I matter. You matter. We matter. God is with us. God loves us. But you know, that's a hard message for us to hear. At least for us to hear and really believe all the way down. Which may be why Tutu repeated it so many times and Bart wrote so many volumes. It's hard for us to hear and really believe because we live in what has been called a secular age or in the words of the great sociologist Max Weber, a disenchanted world. That is, a world in which God, or the gods, or the divine, is no longer understood to be active or present. Now, I admit, what I just said sounds like a professor talking from 30,000 feet. So another story. My daughter Anna is in the 10th grade. She's gotten into fencing. In fact, she's fencing competitively, which means she has practice three times a week, which means I'm driving her there and back 30 minutes each way, which is actually a good thing. You see, in my experience, teenagers will talk to you in a car in a way they won't talk to you anywhere else. Maybe because you don't have to look at each other directly. I don't know. But I have learned that you can communicate a whole lot sideways. It's the 10th grade, so Anna is taking AP World, which means Advanced Placement World History, which means she's studying in the car, going through names, dates, and places, and asking me questions that I frequently don't know the answer to. I mean, what do I know about Mayan civilization or the Chinese Tang Dynasty? When I was in school, history was Western Civ. But that week, they were studying world religions. So Anna asked me, I get how Christianity and Islam began. I mean, Jesus and Muhammad. But what I can't figure out is how did Judaism begin? Okay, now here I know just enough to be dangerous. I could have said, well, Anna, historians and archaeologists theorize that ancient Israel arose from, and not in opposition to, the ancient Canaanites and their religion. They probably were semi-nomadic Canaanite herdsmen who settled in the Middle Highlands, developed new farming techniques, and eventually their own culture and religion which they later took great pains to distinguish from the original 
culture and religion of the Canaanites, which opposition you can see clearly reflected in the Bible. Of course, Anna, the evidence is scanty, so it's all highly speculative, but I could have said all that. But instead, I say this. Oh, that's easy. It's right there all in Genesis, chapters 12 through 18. God did it. God called Abraham and Sarah and said, Go from your country and your people to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And your descendants shall be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands by the sea. God did it, Anna. That's how Judaism began. Long pause. Silence. I give her a little sideways smile. She says, no, really, I want to know. Anna, I just told you, Judaism begins with God calling Abraham and Sarah. Of course, then there's Jacob and his sons and Moses and the Exodus and Mount Sinai and all that. But God did it all. And it begins with God calling Abraham and Sarah. It's all in the Bible. No, Dad, I really want to know. This isn't church. This is AP history. You can see my point here. Going for that AP credit, Anna had already internalized the standards for what makes for a good historical explanation in a secular age. And those standards most decidedly rule out appeals to God, or the gods, or the divine, being active or present in our world. In other words, those standards presume a disenchanted world. And I guess I wanted to point that out to her. And so she gives me a little sideways, well, it's not quite a smile, but a look that says, you know, sometimes I'm glad you're my father, but other times, eh, I'm not so sure. Long pause, silence. I give her a little sideways smile. I'm the only dad you got. Now, believe me, I'm not arguing against AP world history here. In fact, I'm all for it. Much less am I arguing that all historical narratives should conform to the biblical narrative. Not at all. History, and in fact, all the sciences, have made real advances because they have put the question of God and divine causation in general in abeyance, simply saying, we're not going to consider that question for the time being. But that progress comes at a price. The secular age, the disenchanted world, cannot tell us why we matter or whether we matter at all. It cannot provide an ecosystem to nurture our deepest spiritual and human longings. And we human beings long to know whether we matter. If we are going to treat others and ourselves as if we do matter, then we need to believe that we matter in reality and in truth. That is, that we matter to God. We need to believe that God is with us, that God loves us, and so, yes, we need the church. Like many of you, I've been watching the PBS special, The Black Church. This is our so story. This is our song by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Now, I ask you, can there be any doubt that the black church in America has provided such an ecosystem for her people. The church gave people a sense of value, belonging, and worthiness, Oprah Winfrey says in the special. I don't know how we could have survived as a people without it. 
It was our refuge, Michael Eric Dyson says. Literally our sanctuary. It was our balm in Gilead, Gates himself says. The place where our people somehow made a way out of no way. The black church was the place God told the people that they mattered, that their black lives mattered, that God loved them. And they heard it and believed it. And they took it to their hearts and to their lives. And they and their country would never be the same because of it. And I think for us, especially now in our disenchanted world, in our secular age, when the most common answer millennials and Gen Xers give to the question, what is your religious affilia affiliation? When the most common answer is none, we need the church as such a place, such a refuge, such a sanctuary, an ecosystem, if you will, a place where we can hear and believe and practice the message all the way down. God loves you. Jesus loves me and you and you and you and you. I matter. You matter. We matter. God is with us. God loves us. That is why we were delivering bowls of soup during the pandemic. Why children are playing in the bell choir and the percussion choir. Why our youth are still meeting. Why the scaffolding's up to fix the ceiling. Why we are repairing the organ. Why we're continuing the ID ministry. Why we are holding classes, Tze services, and prayers online. Why we are searching for a director of children's and family ministries. So the church can continue to be the church, be that ecosystem, a place where we can hear, believe, and rejoice all the way down that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And when we do that, when we are the church, we will know that God loves us all the way down. And we will treat ourselves and others as if we matter. Because we know that we really do. And because we know that is what's pleasing to God. In his book, No Future Without Forgiveness, Archbishop Tutu put it this way. God loves us now, and God will always love us, all of us, good and bad, forever and ever. His love will not let us go, for God's love for us, all of us, good and bad, is unchanging, is unchangeable. And when I realize the deep love God has for me, I will strive for love's sake to do what is pleasing for my lover. Or as he said in Atlanta, Georgia, on that warm spring Sunday, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you and you and you and you and you and you. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join me now for our affirmation of faith, taken from a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers 
in the one body of Christ, the church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, whose love for us knows no bounds, we thank you for the scandal of the cross. In Jesus Christ, you overturn all our usual ways of behaving and believing. You scatter our false notions of discipleship as easily as coins are spilled from a box. You correct our notions of piety and order with fierce passion. Do not let your church become content or contained as an institution. Raise to ruins what is distorted in us and raise us to new life as a community so that we may be the body of Christ, sharing your love in and for the world. We pray for healing and reconciliation where trust has been broken, hostility has flared, or misunderstanding has grown. Restore us not only to one another, but reconcile us to ourselves and to you, loving God. If restoration proves beyond hope, then grant new beginnings and possibilities for all. In every relationship, we seek your grace as we honor others by caring for them, being truthful, and working for their welfare. Root out in us any jealousy toward what others possess, and let generosity grow in and among us instead. God of hope, we pray for those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit for those lonely and isolated from community, for those burdened by guilt or grief, depression or despair. 
Do not let us turn inward as a church, lest we shut out or neglect those who long for a community of welcome and companionship as the lost sheep longs to return home. Send us out in love with open eyes, ears, and hearts. Make us true neighbors to one another and true children of your own calling. We pray all this in the name of Christ, who has come to set us free and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us live our lives knowing that we matter because God loves us and we are set free to love God and neighbor. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be ours now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>